our Savior came into this world with this plan. God created us. We know the story. We've lived the story. He's created us, and we made our decisions to not follow Him. And so we've been disobedient. Scripture is very clear about this. It's who we are. We've sinned. We've made mistakes. And that's every human being except one we know who is Jesus Himself. And so in our mistakes, in our disobedience, we lost something precious. We lost life itself. We lost connection with the Father, with the God of the universe. We didn't have a bright future. We were destined to be without the Lord and His relationship and the Holy Spirit and God the Father forever. We had lost all of that. But God had a plan. In His love for us, He sent His Son, His only begotten Son, to come to pay the penalty for our sake so that He could forgive us of all of our sins. So He could redeem us so that He could reconcile us with the Father so that we could have what Scripture talks about and we know as new life and life in Jesus Christ and eternal life. He's given us all these extraordinary blessings and this was in accordance with His plan. And so as the plan was unfolding, Jesus came from heaven, was born of the Virgin Mary, and then grew up and lived a perfect life. Scripture is very clear on this. To be the sacrifice that we needed, we needed a perfect life to be sacrificed in our place. And that is the life of Jesus. And we read in the Gospels about the things that Jesus did, the teachings that astounded people with their authority, with the wisdom that people had never heard before. Extraordinary things. And they saw the healings, the miraculous healings, and even the resurrection of a dead man, Lazarus, who had been in the grave for days. And Jesus came and resurrected him. Many had witnessed these things in Israel and were astounded at what they saw. But Jesus didn't come just to teach. He didn't come just to do incredible miracles. He came with the purpose of laying down His very life for you and for me and for everyone who will call on His name out of His love for us. And that's what we encounter when we get to the final week of Jesus leading up to his death on the cross, his crucifixion, where he was abused, where he was persecuted, of course, and he was humiliated even, believe it or not, by many, and he was hung on a tree when he had done nothing wrong. In fact, he was the only human being who had never done anything wrong. And he went to the cross willingly. This is the beauty in the story. This was to be his sacrifice. This is why he came. And he laid down his life. And he died. And you can only imagine in that time and that grief of his disciples of his own mother and others and oh my goodness he's incredible but now look what just happened to him and he's gone he's gone and they had to have been in such terrible distress but just as it was prophesied in scripture just as he had mentioned himself in his teachings with his disciples and others that on the third day he would rise again and that's what we find on Easter morning but this first important context and point is this. The cross of Jesus, His agonizing death, speaks to us loudly of His great sacrifice and His great love for us, for you, for me, for everyone. It speaks loudly. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 5 and 6. You can follow along up on the screen here it reads but he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed we all like sheep have gone astray each of us has turned to his own way 
and the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity, the sin of us all. This was prophesied by Isaiah hundreds of years before, and this is exactly what took place on Good Friday. John 15, 13, Jesus talking about and intimating the significance of some of the things that he would be doing said, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Now it's precious. We all have an understanding of what it might take, even though we haven't had to do it because we're still all here. But to lay down your life for a friend is an extraordinary thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's a sacrifice. You're giving up your life or the continuation of it so that someone else might live. But now this is the God of the universe who came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ and he was laying down his perfect life in exchange for our penalty, for our sins so that we could have eternal life. This isn't just a life for a life. This is one perfect life for the eternal life of so, so many. So this is the beautiful context of the cross. This is why as we come to know Christ in the first place and as we continue to walk with Christ, we go through many things in this life, but God always encourages us to look up. It's easy to look down at the problems and the issues. He asks us and wants us to look up. And He wants us to look up at the cross. Why does He want us to look up at the cross? He wants us... He wants to remind us of the great sacrifice that stands for all time. It's what we talk about, the completed victory on that day that stands for all of history. It's the focal point of all of history when Christ gave his life for you and for me because then our life could truly begin. It's incredible, the gift of God. The free gift. There's nothing you can do to earn it. There's no way to be good enough to earn your salvation. It's this unconditional love, this grace that we speak of, that Scripture speaks of, where we have this unmerited favor, nothing we deserve. But God in His love came and made provision for us by laying down His life. So that's the context of what was going on through Good Friday. And we celebrate the death of Jesus. And we remember it as we take communion here once a month is how we do it at the lighthouse. But we remember it all the time because of how significant it is and the significance of it. But we're not going to go into more detail this morning about how horrifying it was, all the details of what transpired with Christ and how He willingly let it happen and made sure that it happened exactly as it happened in his perfection and how he followed the will of the Father even to the point of a terrible death on the cross. We're here this morning now on Easter Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday, to focus on the resurrection power and life of Jesus Christ. So the focus of Good Friday is the death of Jesus. The focus of Easter is is the celebration of Christ's resurrection. We say, He is risen. And the response is, He is risen indeed. He actually is risen. He rose from the dead. So we're going to read now, and I don't have them up here, but we're going to read two sections. If you have your Bible, open it up to John chapter 20. But I'm going to read this for us because it is awesome. It is so beautiful. And the first part of it is John chapter 20, verses 1 to 9. This is where Mary Magdalene and the disciples find out that the tomb is empty and they're just mystified. So here's how it starts. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other dis disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb 
first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. In parenthesis, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. They were starting to have their eyes opened because they went. And Mary Magdalene, God bless her, and her love and devotion of the Lord shows up for shows up early. And some of the other women in the other gospel accounts were with her. In their devotion, they wanted to show up to make sure everything was square and continue to have their thoughts. And I'm sure grieve, of course. They show up early. And Mary Magdalene finds that the stone had been moved away. This is a massive stone. Who would have moved this stone that was sealing the tomb? But somebody obviously moved the stone. She didn't have the nerve or whatever to go inside. She was just surprised that the stone had been rolled away. What's going on here? And so what does she do? She runs to the disciples. She sees Peter. I'll go to Peter. And she tells them what's going on. And so Peter and John, Scripture says, and we just read it, they race to get to the tomb. They race to get there. John's faster. But he stops, and he looks in, and it's empty. Peter just, bold Peter, just runs right in. We know Peter. He just runs right in and realizes, oh, my goodness. Look at the scene. There's no body there. The tomb is empty. And the strips of linen are there. They're not in disarray. They've been folded in a very special way and put down. And they recognize. John does anyway here. And he starts to believe. He starts to believe. So God is starting to reveal what had been prophesied and what Jesus came to do and how he would not be confined to the grave and that's what we find in these precious precious verses you can only imagine if you were there if you were one of them and if you had come to this tomb and it actually was empty this extraordinary person the miracles that had been done and they'd raise he'd raised Lazarus from the dead and he taught with such great authority and some even speculated some of the disciples even said yes like Peter you are the Christ you are, who do you say at the time? You are the Christ. You're the Messiah, the one who would come, the anointed one. And now the tomb is empty. But the story goes on. In the next verses, it talks about how Jesus actually appears to Mary Magdalene in person. So let's read these verses from verse 10 to verse 18. Then the disciples went back to their homes but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me. She, you can only imagine the response. Just grab on it, grab, let's grab on to this guy. Let's hold him. Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God 
as your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. The tomb is empty. And if that's, if that's all we had, there'd be a lot more speculation. But Jesus shows up in person, in the flesh. Not some apparition. Later on, we realized that from our scripture that he appeared to also to the disciples and to others on the road to Emmaus. And he opened scripture to them. And he shared a meal with them. And he continued to stay with them before he ascended into heaven. So it's remarkable again what transpired with this eyewitness testimony and the things that truly happened that are recorded for us and we know it to be true and accurate. And the reality is Jesus Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. And he has all power and authority. Scripture talks to us about now as Lord, as Savior of mankind. So it brings us to some understanding. There's a lot of things that, that emanate from the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the beauty of it and what's been accomplished for all times. Some of the things that we prayed about earlier, some of the things we've already talked about this morning, but there's a couple of things further that I want to highlight. Christ's death and resurrection, this is point three, in your bulletin up on the PowerPoint, brings reconciliation and hope. Reconciliation with the Father, reconciliation with other believers, reconciliation between Israel Israel and, and Gentiles. It's amazing the reconciliation that takes place through Christ Jesus and brings hope. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, they're on the screen. Read along with me. At that time, you were separate from Christ. Paul's writing to the church. The Gentile church in Ephesus. At that time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenant of the promise that God had made to the Israelites. You were without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. This is the reconciliation. This is the redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ is how this has taken place. We were lost. We were so far away from God and God himself came and sacrificed his son and his son came willingly to be that sacrifice so that we could be reconciled and brought near to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. But we were without hope. And Jesus comes, and now we are filled with hope for today, for tomorrow, for the future, for all of eternity. It's amazing, the gift. Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and 5 read this way. We were therefore buried with him, through, with Jesus, through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Here it is, new life in Christ. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. So the fact that Jesus came and died for you and me and now is resurrected and has power and authority over all things, he has actually given this very resurrection life to you and to me. He's given us a power, even an authority. Be careful how you use it but a power and an authority that comes from Christ alone as He's come to take residence in your life. He's not a close friend. He's closer than a close friend. He's actually come in through His resurrection power and life and through God's Holy Spirit into your life and the life of everyone who believes in Jesus, simply, truly believes in Jesus as Savior and as Lord and now he's come into your life and he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Scripture is very clear on that too. And all of history is as well. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. No matter how tough things are in this life, and they'll be tough. Everybody tells me how tough they are. 
And I said, but you don't have it anything like me. And they said, oh, are you crazy? No, it's tough. This life is hard. There's blessings and there's huge challenges. Health-wise, finance, relationship, you name it. There are challenges here and things that just being in this culture, in this world, because there's plenty of people out there also, like you and me, who are not perfect. And they need Jesus Christ too. But Jesus has come into our life. And we can celebrate that every day. And we can have hope every day. We can have a certain power every day as we follow Christ and tap into what He has given to us that will not leave and go away. So our final point this morning is this. It's that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. I want to go back and read these verses in this conversation with Martha when they had sent for Jesus. Martha and Mary, their brother Lazarus was ill and they sent for Jesus and Jesus didn't come right away. And then Lazarus died and then Jesus showed up and Martha is beside herself and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She had a great faith in the Lord. If, he had, if you'd been here, if you'd showed up a little earlier, he wouldn't be dead. You can imagine the tears, the emotions that are flowing, this great trust and this huge disappointment, and she's there with the Lord. But she says, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Love that. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Wow. That's reassuring. That's comforting. But Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I know that he has a relationship. It's good. He's going to be resurrected. We all will be, you know, who are part of the covenant and the promise with Israel. and We'll all be resurrected in that last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? What's her response? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Jesus started this conversation he could have just gone and raised Lazarus immediately and then explained a lot of things he had this conversation with Martha before then he went over to the tomb and raised Lazarus from the dead his testing of Martha this profound conversation with Martha that truly revealed to her these great and wonderful insights as to who he really is this goes so much further than someone just being resurrected from the dead because he was going to resurrect Lazarus from the dead and then Lazarus was going to live the rest of his life then he was going to die this goes so far beyond just resurrecting someone from the dead and having that power I am the resurrection and the life I am the resurrection and the life if you believe in me you will never die you will have eternal life and because I am the life, you will have my life. And these are the great and precious gifts that God has given to each and every one of us who simply believe Him for who He really is. And she says, yes, I believe. I believe you're the Christ, the Son of God who was to come into the world. And she could have gone on to save the world because that's what He did. And that's what He's continuing to do today for anyone who has, for whatever reason, not had this opportunity or taken advantage of the opportunity to embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior, He's available. He's available now. This is the perfect day to come forward and to say, wow, I, I don't have this relationship. I didn't have this understanding. But I'm missing the God of the universe in my life. I really am. This happened to me when I was 14 years old. And the Lord moved on me and I had a really good life. I had a great family. I had a lot of blessings. 
and there was something desperately missing in me. And I found out, thanks to God's grace, and thanks to those who instructed me at the time, in Bible study, in youth group, that who I was missing was the God of the universe, and my Savior, and my Redeemer. But I needed to confess my sin, recognize my part in this, and then invite Jesus to come into my life. I had to ask His forgiveness for my sin. And from that day forward, everything has changed. Not all my circumstances. Circumstances could be circumstances. But God has come into my life. And He's come into your life if you've done the same thing. And He's available for anyone who calls on His name. So if this is you this morning, I really would like to talk with you after the service. If there's no better time than to come forward and to have an honest conversation and even to pray and talk to our Father together and invite Jesus to come into your life. It makes all the difference. This life is busy. This life is full of challenges. There's all kinds of philosophies and thoughts. There's all kinds of people and things we can look to. But Scripture is very clear on this. There's only one person we can look to for our very salvation and for eternal life, and that's Jesus. It's Jesus. He's the only one. Scripture is very clear. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. There is no other way to the Father. And it's not just a belief and a philosophy. It then becomes this relationship with the God of the universe in the person of Jesus Christ. And then we live our lives accordingly, following Him. And if we're honest, and we are, we still make plenty of mistakes. But we make our mistakes not wanting to, but when we do, knowing that even those sins are forgiven forever. Not as an encouragement to go out and do whatever we want and make more mistakes, but as an encouragement to say, well, God's grace is going to cover everything that you've done that's off base. Everything I've done where I haven't followed the Lord, and that's plenty. He's covered it with His blood. He's just asking me now to believe, not just in who He is, but that He has given me this life, this victorious, conquering life, so that when challenges come, or even just favor and blessings, I can look to God, and I can give thanks to God, and I can live my life following God as best I can with His help. And that makes all the difference. That's what He's looking for once we've come to know Him, is that we truly follow Him, just like He followed the Father perfectly. And as we do that, it's amazing what God does in your life and how He comes in and how He intervenes in specific circumstances and how He tests us and how He helps us. It's amazing the life of a believer. There's nothing like the life of a believer in Jesus Christ. And you'll be tested at every turn because God wants to for you to demonstrate your faith in Him, your trust in Him. I was talking with a dear sister who I just met this morning, and we were talking about a conversation about trusting in the Lord more and more and more and more. For believers in Christ, it's all a question of trust. Do I really trust Him for this big challenge? It seems bigger than the other ones. And we can. We can. He'll get us through it. He'll help us through it. He'll build a testimony through it. So we have this precious gift, which is not just everything that was accomplished on the cross almost 2,000 years ago. And with the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have the gift of Jesus Christ Himself in relationship with us as part of our life, in our lives, through His Holy Spirit that then permeate who we are and give us purpose, and peace that transcends understanding, a joy that you cannot contain, and a future that will never be confined. It will just continue to open up before us. And that's God's promise. And that's His truth. And that's in His Holy Word. And it's throughout. So this is our message for this morning. It's to celebrate Jesus Christ for what He's done for us and who He is to us and as a part of our very lives to celebrate His resurrection on Easter Sunday and every day for the rest of our lives on this planet 
And then I can only imagine what it will be like when we're translated into glory with Him forevermore. But to have that relationship today and every day means everything to me and to you and to everyone who's come to know Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your holy word. Thank you for everything that Christ has accomplished. It even goes beyond the foundational and hugely important things we've discussed this morning. There are so many different aspects and things that you provide through Jesus Christ for each and every one of us. But it starts, Lord, with embracing you as Lord and Savior. So I thank you for the gift of salvation to everyone who's called on your name. And I pray for everyone, for everyone who does not know you this way, that they will come to know you this way, even this day, Lord, for your glory and for their eternal blessing. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.